uh, great. So just uh, checking that uh, we are live actually, yes. I think we are live and let me just check Instagram as well to make sure everything is uh, good and then we can start the great. So I think uh, we are live now. So uh, great. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, 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 Thanks for joining and sorry we had some delay, you know, these are uh, live. Uh, there are some personal issues may happen, some miscommunication happens, but uh, we are very glad to have uh, uh, Peter Shore uh, here for this live. And we are uh, talking about I mean, several issues from live, from early life, then about Shore's famous algorithm and uh, several other things. And uh, we hope that, I mean, you enjoy that. Uh, so uh, let's start, I mean, uh, by uh, some of the connection that actually I had with Peter and I'm uh, very happy actually that we had some common things. So uh, I think the first thing is that uh, we, uh, I co-advised by Tom Layton and Peter also advised by Tom Layton. So it is like a great mathematician, computer scientist and CEO of Akamai. So that's the first thing. I think after that, uh, he joined also Bell, at and Bell Labs. It was the same company, I believe, at that time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, his boss was David Johnson, actually. I joined also at and and my boss was David Johnson. I think he was a great figure. And really, I'm very proud that he was my boss. Unfortunately, he passed away something like five years ago. Uh, and I have also written some... Uh, uh, note actually on his memory on uh, Bill Gossard and Lance Fortno blog. Please feel free to read it. That was the same time actually my dad passed away and he was like, like same, he I felt like he, is, he was my father in some sense. And it, uh, he was a great figure, I think. Uh, and that's another common thing. And uh, like, uh, of course we got both uh, or uh, like a PhDs from MIT and uh, working with Tom Layton. And we both work actually on the planar graph. So hopefully we will get uh, more uh, and hear more from uh, Peter about uh, his PhD thesis. And last but not least, actually two of my uh, friends, uh, I think uh, Mohsen Bahram Giri and uh, Salman Beghi, they were uh, Peter's uh, PhD students. Both they were great. And interestingly, both uh, were uh, IMO medalists like Peter. So I think that's also another interesting thing that was, uh, um, I mean, some interesting thing. And Peter, I think, joined uh, around the 2001 to 2002 to MIT. At that time, I just started my PhD at uh, MIT. So uh, given this background, I think uh, uh, we will go and uh, start, I mean, uh, talking with uh, Peter and get, I mean, some and nicer stories from him, and of course, more technical details. We try to have some educational background. And hopefully at the end, we will uh, ask him I mean, some important questions. I think that's a new thing that we have added uh, here, such that the people, I mean, they can refer actually to this video and think about it. And yeah, uh, great. So I think, uh, do you want to say some starting board? Um, well, I haven't prepared anything. It's really, um, you know, Good seeing you again, again with all these connections we have. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was Tom Layton's first advisee, and he told me that, you know, I created absolutely unrealistic expectations for him about what an advisee should be <laughs> like. <laughs> so he was disappointed with his second advisee, who um, 
was Satish Rao, who's also a great computer scientist, <laughs> but I guess was not quite as independent as I was. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, Tom Layton thinks, especially I mean, he's like very bright and sometimes, I mean, I think for me or lots of others, like I heard this from Satish also, like <laughs> going at his speed was a bit hard, I think. And uh, I think uh, you mentioned also in uh, one of these uh, other videos, by the way, I encourage everyone actually to uh, watch this video that Peter prepared. I think that was for physics and computation. If you search on Peter Shore at YouTube, you will find it. This is like 30 minutes that uh, Peter is talking about uh, how he obtained famous Shore's algorithm, all the stories. These are actually very interesting to me. And also he's talking about an error correcting code and quantum error correcting code. You can take a look at it. We will go briefly on some of these stories and we give the summary here, but that's uh, nice things. And I think, yeah, uh, I think Tom was <laughs> great in, uh, you mentioned about there about Stock Fox counting the papers in Stock Fox, and I think Tom was great there. So maybe he was not active in the past 20 to 20 years, at least not that much, but still, I think in terms of his papers, he's one of the top people. So he, I think he's uh, fast to catch. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, like, uh, I think uh, let's start from the beginning and uh, like, uh, um, I was checking actually, and uh, IMO started something like uh, 1959 or 57. So it was like almost 20 years after that, that you got actually, you represented US team and you got a silver medal uh, in uh, IMO, uh, International Math Olympiad. I got actually silver in uh, the IOI, Informatics Olympiad. And uh, so there is, I mean, uh, some similarities and some differences so that we will uh, talk about it. And lots of great people in the community actually had participated in this. So I think for me, it was a great uh, honor that can participate on those. So do you want to start, I mean, from that, when did you start, I mean, even thinking about math? I think you have done something on uh, some experience at Putnam that you also can uh, discuss. And why math? Any person in the family was uh, like a math professor or... Uh, on, like was interested in that, yeah. Well, um, so no math professors, but my father was an engineer and my um, uncle was, uh, my uncle, you know, um, George, Christian Shore was a uh, oceanographer, and my another uncle worked at Oak Ridge as an atomic scientist or atomic engineer. And um, so I come, you know, so all of my uncles and aunts are, I should say, nearly all my uncle and aunts are in some field of science or engineering. So I guess I um, got some talent from, <clears throat> from you know, my um, genes. And um, my father used to give me math questions when I was um, a small kid and I'd solve them. And, um, you know, and then I was always good at math in school and, um, in high school, as a junior, they- in Which high school was that? It was Tamil Pius High School in Marin County. Uh, so which uh, state? California. Oh, California, okay. Yeah. So um, they gave this national high school math test for people who wanted to take it. And I took it as a junior. I think I must have missed it as a sophomore. And then um, I got high enough score that they put me in the, you know, they sent it to me the next level or the next test, which is the next level of competition. And I did really well in that. So um, the top 25 people from that who are not seniors and the top six, the top eight people who were the team go on to um, 
math olympia training camp and i went to that camp as a junior and next year i took the um you know the same test and placed high enough to get put on the u.s team and we went to yugoslavia and we competed against um other countries and we won so I, what I, was the ranking of u.s at that competition well we won the u.s it, ranked it, first in that year Okay, yeah. So you got the first ranking. So that's a, that's the thing I just wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, so you got the, essentially the uh, highest ranking in the world in that uh, competition. Uh, yeah. Uh, great. Yeah, that's actually. I mean, this uh, thing that you mentioned happens. I mean, like almost in nowadays in lots of countries, it is like that. That you need to pass several steps and go to some camps. And uh, like for me, actually, lots of this thing that I learned from computer science is probably the undergrad didn't add that much to me that, that those camps were, I mean, we essentially knew everything from those camps, maybe a little bit, I mean, they are doing more research during undergrad, but that was the start of these things. And uh, especially uh, like the math or uh, this informatics Olympiad, they are like very related to the current work of, I mean, CS, especially theoretical CS, I will say. And why did you this, uh, so uh, have you been in the uh, math department or at MIT or you have been in the ECS at that time when you joined? Oh, I mean, I, I got my graduate degree in mathematics. And good. I am now part of the mathematics department. So uh, uh, yeah, great. Because I have actually been also in the math department. So okay. that is uh, like at MIT, especially there is a very good relation between. I mean, especially there was no CS per se. It was ECS and math. And theoretical CS was shared between the math and the ECS. I think that was the LCS, and then changed to CSAIL uh, nowadays. That's somehow intersection of several of these. And I think now. Uh, there is a college of computing as well. That's also a combination of several uh, things. So, and uh, uh, great. So, uh, uh, do you want to say anything about your family? Do you have children or? I have two children. Um, I guess the oldest has graduated from college, but, um, you know, she did it. She graduated during the pandemic and she has not really found a job yet. She's just been taking temporary things. So. She needs to find a job. She met, she majored in math, but um, I think she didn't really want to, you know, leave home during the pandemic. So she's still here and doing stuff. And the younger one is, um, I guess, taking a year off from college. I see. And uh, so you uh, you had some uh, encourage uh, you encourage them essentially for math as well, like your <laughs> well, uh, but. I mean, they're both good at math, and my um, my older daughter, um, you know, is you know like math enough to major in it. So, uh, so, so that's actually, I mean, the question that I had it. I think it's about personal life. Like for my son, is like uh, actually he's uh, very good. He's like uh, nine and a half years old, and he's uh, reading these materials. I don't know. I mean, like encouraging. I mean, I have participated in this uh, Olympias. I would be happy if he's doing that. But you know, you, they should decide. So what's your take on that? Yeah, well, I think you don't want to push them too much. I mean, exactly. the the tar top, um, you know, I why have I forgotten his name? The top um, member of our team in the US, um, of the U.S. Math Olympiad team when I was in high school, um, just after he, you know, graduated, he decided he was sick of math. I think because maybe his parents pushed him too much, or maybe something else, and he went on to become, uh, you know, in the he went on to the financial industry to make a lot of money. Yeah, so, actually, this happens. I mean, uh, this I have seen this one for several. I mean, uh, people who are working there. I think there is some kind of stress and also, I mean, uh, hard work that not maybe long term, it might be not the best for everyone. And uh, at some point you may essentially, I don't know, burn out or I think that the same thing somehow happened for Perlman that also who proved this uh, uh, famous conjecture. And I think after that, he 
is not around in the math things. So that's uh, interesting actually that, I think the main thing is that we should not push. So if they like, they should go and if not, they should decide yeah. about the next uh, step. Uh, uh, great. And uh, uh, like, uh, 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 nowadays, so uh, like I think some other things, the people actually are asking this. So how many hours per day are you working? So is this working hard now or I mean, taking it more relaxed and? Well, I don't think I can actually work on mathematical research more than three or four hours a day because my brain just gets too, um, I don't know, it overloads or something. <laughs> but of course, if you're teaching, if you're writing up papers, I guess even if you're writing computer programs, you know, you can do those. Is it, uh... Uh, are you There's writing programs? To the three or four hours a day that you actually spend um, thinking about math research. Uh, so are you writing programs nowadays even? Um, I have written two or three small programs for my latest. Um, so my, so I have a paper that just came out on quantum money. And we can talk about that more later. But sure. you know, writing this pa writing this paper, there were three or four times. Well, actually, I'm exaggerating. There were like two or maybe even three times when I wanted to write a program, and these were all, you know, very minor programs, which took me like three or four hours to write at most. And um, I mean, that uses a different part of your brain than thinking about mathematics and so you know that doesn't count against the um, three or four hours a day yeah actually i mean that's like because i'm writing actually programs so what language are you using are you using python or c um well i've been using matlab and maple so. oh i see okay so that like the <laughs> like i think the python is the more uh recent one i didn't write i mean until a few years ago but i was doing c plus plus and pascal and other things like uh, but this is actually python is nowadays is a nice one I, I really encourage everyone to go and learn that i mean even if you are a professor actually that's very important i think one story it was interesting this year we had some kind of hiring committee and to get the votes I just have written a, a Python program that because there were several people in the committee to get all the votes and sort them essentially. I used a, just a, like a Python program to do that. And it was much easier to, to do it uh, like uh, over, uh, I mean, if you want to do it by hand. So that's actually a, a nice thing and very happy to hear that you are also uh, writing programs. Uh, great. Uh, so I think, uh, so uh, like, uh, uh, I think maybe this is a good question to ask. Uh, like, I mean, you have this uh, nice algorithm that we will discuss. And how much do you think that uh, this math Olympiad had effect in your life? Like a big effect or, I mean, it was moderate and you could do that even without that, without math? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, um, it probably helped me get into college. <laughs> yeah, sure. And where did you go for a bachelor? I went to Caltech for a bachelor's degree. Oh, bachelor, okay. And, um, you know, the, the um, Math Olympiad gives you, or rather the trainings programs for the Math Olympiad give you a lot of, um, I guess, expertise and tricks for combinatorics. And during um, college, I really liked combinatorics. And I did spend one summer um, you know, Herb Reiser, who now unfortunately, well, actually he died quite a while ago, but um, he was, you know, he gave me this problem on transversals of Latin squares. And I spent the entire summer, I guess, spent half the summer banging my head against the wall, trying to figure out, trying to get anywhere on it. And then finally, I actually got a result that was much better than the previous result. Although it's, you know, so the, the, the theorem is 
The theorem you'd like to prove is that every Latin square has a transversal of length n minus one. What was known before was n minus um, n to the one third or something like that. So I showed n minus log n squared um, and it took, you know, when I published this paper and it was the first paper I wrote, it was absolutely unreadable. And um, 25 years later, Puya Hatami, who was, you know, an undergrad in Iran. Um, yeah. You know him. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know him, yeah. Yeah, so um, he found a mistake in my calculations. I had flipped one inequality from a less than or equal to sign to a greater than or equal to sign in my calculations. So we fixed that and, you know, updated the paper. And when we sent it out to the referees, or we sent it out to, you know, the same journal I published the first paper in as an erratum, and one of the referees said, I don't believe the first paper, it's absolutely incomprehensible. <laughs> so I looked at it and it really was absolutely incomprehensible. <laughs> so I rewrote the first paper to make it comprehensible. And then Puya Hatami and I, you know, published the um, whole thing, I, you know, again in the journal. And it's now correct. And actually only, I think, two or, two or three years ago, someone improved the result from n minus log n squared to n minus log n, but the n minus one question is still open. Uh, great. So, and, I mean, uh, this inequality that you had in the reverse direction, did it didn't change the result? It did not change the result. Uh, great. <laughs> actually, the, the fix we found weakened the result slightly, but, I mean, it weakened the constant, but you can go back and you can look at the equations and you know you can actually derive um, better constant than the original one if you are careful. So. Um, yeah, uh, so that's great. I think you were lucky in that one because one equation can, I think it depends on the constant I understand. Maybe the constant is not the, uh, sometimes you try to approximate it, maybe not the, Best constant, but still you can get some results. But sometimes, of course, it can break the whole thing. I think we were talking with uh, Professor Matthew Sudan previous uh, week that we had live, and this was based on some uh, Twitter, uh, I mean, trend that I think one person mentioned about this conference, NURIPS, that if a paper, <laughs> most of the proofs are correct, I will be happy with that. I think that's an interesting thing when you work in the mathematics. And I think we were talking actually with. Um, uh, Professor Sudan, that if there is just uh, if you have just one sentence wrong, you can prove anything that you want. So yeah. the fact that most of it was correct, I mean, doesn't mean that much essentially, because <laughs> you can prove anything just with one sentence wrong. But uh, um, but you know it. No, I think that what was happening is you know we had this set of equations and I needed to figure out how fast a sequence satisfying these set of equations would grow, and my intuition about why it had to grow fairly fast was completely correct. It's just that in proving it, my um, my calculations were wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that happens. I mean, I think, but the good thing is that we will uh, fix it. And yeah, and if there is something wrong, actually mentioned, I think we had the, the same, actually, we had a paper. This was with uh, Nogal and Tom Layton and Eric Demain. And uh, and actually, we had also a bug in the proof that we had some counterexample part of it. I mean, it was important counterexample that we had a bug in it because there was one case that we didn't, I mean, check that. And also, I mean, Somebody mentioned that, oh, there's this one and we can use the computer actually to create one. So we have done exactly the same thing. We had some kinds of, I mean, another paper, I think the same journal and discrete math. I so thought that was, there were some issues, but now we can fix it. So I think the fact that uh, we mentioned it explicitly if something wrong and try to uh, fix it, that's a very important thing. One important part of math that 
we are working with theorem. Uh, great. So uh, uh, good. So and uh, like uh, I think we discussed briefly about working with Tom. I think you were the first the advisor of Tom, and so you were working on the planar graph and bin packing. So it was a bit two different topics. I think that you will put it in your thesis. So do you want to tell a little bit about those things? Well, they're not two different topics. So uh, yeah. So okay. <laughs> so they're yeah. they're they're um. I mean. They're one topic and an application of the same topic. Okay, <laughs> good. So do you want so, to um, a little bit about yeah. that? That would be great. Right. I mean, it's it's title certainly looks like a staple gun thesis, yes. but it's not really. So um, I went to Bell Labs for some various summers. You know, for as a summer intern, I think I'm trying to remember if it was twice or three times during my. Um, PhD, I think it was just twice. And um, there was this um, group of people who were working on bin packing, doing lots of experiments that included um, David Johnson and yeah. John Bentley and several under, other interns, um, Lyle McGew, Kathy McGew, and um, Tom Layden was involved too, although. Um, he wasn't at the labs that summer. He was just, um, I don't know. I think he must have visited and got involved. <laughs> and anyway, um, he, anyway, they had these results that showed that this, you know, these two algorithms, best fit and first fit, did really well when they were. Um, you know, when you put in uniform random um, pieces, they packed them and they nearly filled the bins. So your question was how much empty space you get in the bin. And um, they plotted the curves and got something like n to the 0.6 and n to the 0.8. And anyway, I started looking at this and it turns out that it um, is equivalent to a probability problem, which is suppose you put two colors of random points in a unit square, and uh, you want to match every red point to every blue point, yeah. how short can you make these lines? And suppose you want to match the red points only to blue points above and to the right of them, how many points can you match? So essentially the matching problem on this uh, uh, like a square with these right. two colors, bipartite matching. Yeah. Yes. And um, I discovered later that this was an open probability problem and um, that I had actually solved it. <laughs> and um, so the, you know, the relation of the bin packing problem to the points in the square was fairly straightforward. And I came up with a complicated proof of how well you could do planar matching on these points in a square. And the answer was, um, I think, square root of n times log n to the three quarters. Great. So, okay. So, I think I now I found what was the source of confusion. I think here by planar, you mean really two dimensional plane. That's right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, because I think this was some of the things maybe at that time, I think you got your PC in 1985. Am I right? Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, I think at that time, maybe there was not much that distinction between this. So generally, I think uh, nowadays we say, when we say plane graph, means those graphs essentially in 2D or 3D, these are like in the plane. But when we talk about the planar graph, we generally mean those graphs that you can draw them essentially in a plane such that no two edges cross each other. And, right. uh, and I think your work was more on the plane graph essentially. That's right. Okay, now I actually I understand quite well <laughs> why this has happened. And I think uh, for the people, this bin packing is one of the most important problem. I think David Johnson was probably the favorite problem of uh, David Johnson. And here is a very practical problem that you have a set of items uh, and each of them have volume and you want to minimize in, put them in some boxes and each of these boxes has some volume. You want to, find say minimum number of boxes that you can put them 
And there are several approximations that they are considering. Maybe if some box, you can go a little bit more than capacity, then what is the best approximation that you can get it? But in general, packing items into boxes, that's like the very important bin packing problem. And there are great work actually on that one. And uh, uh, Peter actually mentioned that. Great. Uh, so uh, after that, I think uh, you were at uh, you were at Bell Labs, of course, at that time. Uh, uh, did they call it AT and T at that time, actually, or uh, it was AT and T Bell Labs? AT and T Bell Labs. Labs. Yeah, that was this uh, favorite. Uh, I mean, like I think probably one of the best places to do research, uh, long time ago, uh, and probably still. I mean, there are some good researchers there, but maybe not that prominent comparing to those times. And then you got your PhD with Tom. And by the way, why did, you why did you choose Caltech versus MIT or Harvard? Because nowadays I'm checking lots of people who have the metal, they are going to MIT or Harvard. Was there any specific reason? Just Well, I guess Caltech was on the West Coast and I lived yeah, on the West Coast, was. so that's one reason. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's. Yeah, so did you ever uh, think to go there, uh, like MIT or Harvard or others, or that was an obvious choice to go to Caltech? I mean, I I got into all three of them. So, I see. Um, and then you decided to go to Caltech. That's I actually decided to go to Caltech. Uh, are you giving the same recommendation even now? Um, well, even. I mean. I mean, Caltech is smaller, so it doesn't cover as much, you know, uh, as many. It, there aren't people working in as many different areas of research as there are at Harvard or MIT. Yeah. But um, it still is very good. Yeah, I think one one aspect of Caltech that I like is like much like fewer students. Uh, maybe I think the ratio of students to faculty maybe is higher. And uh, maybe you can get more special, I mean, treatment there comparing to MIT, of course, that's like, for example, a lot of competition. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. If you like competition, you should go to MIT. That's like the thing that, and again, I mean, that I heard this one, even when I went to CMU, I could see actually a difference between MIT and CMU, though both are top schools. But uh, great. So uh, then after that, I mean, you got a PhD with Tom, and then you went uh, to Caltech again uh, for post. No, I went to UC Berkeley for. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. that was UC Berkeley. So that oh. was uh, so uh, and uh, so. Uh, with whom did you work more? Because I think we are talking more about uh, um, Umesh Vazirani and the story actually that about uh, short algorithm. But uh, did you work with uh, Umesh at that time, or did you work with another person? Um, I no Umesh and his brother VJ. And I were all, so I went to UC Berkeley when the Math Sciences Research Institute was having a program on um, theoretical computer science. Yeah. And the Math Sciences Research Institute is this um, building up on the top of the hill above UC Berkeley. Yeah. And I had the best view in my office I've ever had because it was- uh, I had it the same thing down, for two, three weeks, yeah, in that place, down it's a great place. The, yeah, looking down over San Francisco Bay and um, yeah, so I was, yeah, I was there for a year and the people I, and Richard Karp was the one running the um, program. Yeah. So I guess he was officially my um, postdoc mentor, but I didn't, I didn't really interact with him very much. I do remember that when I was, no, I talked to him before I'd actually proved my, um, you know, bin packing result. And I said, that I thought the um, answer was going to be root n times log n to the three quarters. And he said, that's a crazy function. There can't be anything that's actually really like that. Yeah. And um, so anyway, when I was there, I worked with um, Alok Agarwal and Maria Clave and Leo Gibbous and Alok Agarwal was working on 
geometry problems. So I did, I started doing computational geometry then. Uh, uh, great. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, yeah, go and ahead. We, we did a lot of, I mean, there were a lot of good papers that came out of that. Yeah, so in some sense, I mean, uh, because of this plain thing that you mentioned, you were already doing computational geometry, at least by definition, because that's one of the important things. But I think you continued in some sense more. And how many years have you been there postdoc? Uh, like It was a one-year program, so I was there a year. You and after that, I took a job at um, Bell Labs. Uh, and I think David Johnson was the, your uh, boss at that time, your manager at that time, correct? Yeah, David Johnson was here. Let me. Um, yeah, turn on. <laughs> David Johnson was my boss. In fact, oh wait, was he? Um, I don't think he was originally. I, I think uh, Gary was, might. Um, I mean, so there was Mike Gary and Ron Graham. Yeah, were the people who were. In yeah, I mean, so Mike Gary and Ron Graham were um, man were um, managers at that time. I, managers yeah. at that time. I yeah. think Mike Gary. Mike Gary was my boss. Yeah, I, that was my early collection from talking with David Johnson. Yeah, right. And then after after some point, Mike Gary. Um, I forget whether he stepped down or he retired. Yeah, retired, exactly, yeah. But anyway, David Johnson took over from him. Yeah, exactly. I think that was the understanding from uh, David, that he was like, Mike Gary was that. And uh, of course, I mean, for the audience, this famous Gary Johnson book, uh, uh, like Computers and Interactability, A Guide to the Theory of MP Completeness. I think that's probably the most famous computer science book, at least maybe 20 few years ago, I don't know, data science, some paper. It was certainly maybe the had more famous, citations. Um, it was certainly one of the famous ones back then. I mean, I think actually Knuth's book might have been more famous, but yeah. Uh, great. So uh, then uh, have you uh, continued uh, commercial geometry? Where you, so how was the, uh, like the situation there? Like uh, in a sense that uh, you, like how free have you been because that was industry bell labs but of course it was a great place lots of people like have been actually in that place and have done great research probably the unique place that you could do research and uh, have you done i mean anything for the company and how did you i mean did you continue commercial geometry and crypto stuff or yeah well i continued doing computational geometry the entire time i was there or rather yeah I shouldn't say the entire time. I continued doing computational geometry for the first um, 10 years I was there at least. And um, um, some of the um, stuff I did was actually, you know, quite practical. I mean, I have this algorithm with Ken Clarkson for computing convex hulls, which just recently got the test of time award for the computational geometry conference yeah congratulations. Has been very widely used and in fact it's just one of a whole i mean as a whole paradigm for doing for creating you know for algorithms for building objects in computational geometry and there are lots more examples of this that are, um, came after our paper. And let's see, what was I gonna say? So, um, I've lost my talk. You are actually <laughs> great in remembering names. Uh, some, of these, some of these people actually mentioned about uh, Henry L and others at <laughs> at and in the other, uh, YouTube video that, oh, I just said, oh, I forgot his name actually, and you're great. So yeah, please go ahead. I think if Who's you don't name? remember something, I'm sure that is hard to remember for yeah. anyone else. Right, so um, 
anyway, I was, um, oh, John Bentley was the other person on this um, bin packing paper. I've forgotten that. And I think don't think Tom Layden was on the first one of these. He was on a later paper. Uh, oh. For uh, yeah, I think you had a few papers with Tom actually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do. Yeah. Um, so where did I? Anyway, yeah. So I um. Yeah, so there was another um, <clears throat> thing we really did, which we did there, which was, um, I guess, came directly out of, uh, of, you know, I guess, development. Um, there were these developers who were trying to understand this Russian paper about how to construct rectilinear Steiner trees. Yeah. And, um, I looked on it. I looked at it with, um, oh gosh, I've forgotten his name now. It'll probably come back to me in a little while. Yeah, <laughs> sure. And um, we showed that it was actually um, wrong. <laughs> and that the problem they were trying to solve was NP hard. And we came up with a approximation algorithm for that problem. And um, that's what they're used. That's what they used. <laughs> Yeah, so that's like I think for this rectilinear uh, Steiner tree, that, that what that problem was NP hard. So they yeah. uh, they obtained some polynomial time algorithm at that time for that. They Who? claim. Oh no, yeah, I'm Russian, happy. They, this Russian claimed to obtain a linear programming um, a, a, a algorithm for that. Algorithm for that, but it was wrong. And oh yeah, and uh, so it was Frank Wang, who I was working with, who um found the Steiner tree problem, or rather who, um, we showed that the, the um, Russian algorithm was wrong and we came up with a, well, an approximation algorithm, but probably good enough for the developers. But I'm sure yeah. it was, I was sure it was more than good enough for the developers. Uh, yeah, uh, that, I mean, uh, I think we had this, this discussion of approximation algorithms actually with, uh, uh, David Johnson and we can talk about it. I mean, ours and ours. Uh, yeah, so that is uh, uh, great. Now, uh, so so you were working on commercial geometrics. Uh, you mentioned, I think, this idea about. I'm saying some of this uh, summary of from the other uh, video that actually Peter had it like a year ago. So uh, then uh, you mentioned that when you uh, were at Caltech, you were in some talk by uh, Richard Feynman who is right, like right. one of the actually most important figure probably in quantum computation. And then you had some ideas about the quantum at that time. And then you mentioned uh, this, there was this talk by Umesh Vazirani that he tried to model uh, quantum computation as like, I mean, we had Turing essentially for classic compu computers and he modeled essentially a nice way for quantum computation. So, uh, did, uh, so, and this was one part, part of the story. And uh, then you were talking about being in a program committee of Stack, and Stack and Fox are two main important theoretical computer science conferences. I think nowadays SODA is also there. I think I'm not so sure at that time actually SODA even existed. Uh, so then uh, you, I mean, uh, read the paper by uh, Dan Simon and uh, like he submitted the paper there. Uh, unfortunately, the paper didn't get in. And then you were thinking more about that, given I think the idea that uh, Umesh mentioned about the quantum computations, probably Dan used some of those ideas. And then the fast Fourier transfer. I, I, where did you, I mean, I mean, of course, you have some ideas that that is useful for your periodic uh, functions to get the results. And fast Fourier transfer actually is a very, one of the most important uh, tools that we have it is uh, you can, I mean, think about like 
one of the main application is that when you want to multiply two polynomials, you can multiply and you can do it n log n versus order uh, n square if you want to do it naively. And it has lots of other applications actually in E and other places. So, uh, and you could combine them and you could build on that. Uh, uh, I mean, like somehow think more uh, about quantum computation model. And then you came for with the first algorithm that in quantum computers, you could do the discrete log. And the discrete log uh, is the problem of, I mean, I was searching actually, it's just uh, taking the logarithm, but it is discrete in a sense that we are finding in some group that I think cyclic group or some other particular group. And then you were thinking more and you could generalize it for uh, like uh, this uh, factoring that a number is given to you, I don't know, even something like maybe 1000 bits. It, it is still hard if you want to do in this classic computer to factor it into prime factors, but uh, that was a thing that you could generalize it for quantum computation. So I tried to get, I mean, some give some brief uh, summary of that. I think you can now, I mean, go and uh, add more to that. And so the, the first question, uh, why did you get interested in quantum computation? It might be a bit far from, again, from geometry. I might be wrong. You can mention the <laughs> relation better. Well, I took a lot of quantum courses in college and so I had a reasonable understanding of quantum mechanics. <coughs> Excuse me. And then when Charles Bennett came and talked about his quantum key distribution algorithm, which is BB84, um, he gave a talk at Path and Bell Labs. And I don't remember exactly when, but I think it must have been in the late 1980s. Um, I started thinking about that for a little while. But then, so the big open question there was, how to prove that this algorithm was secure rigorously. And I didn't see any way to um, make any headway on it at all. So I gave up on that question. But um, I started thinking me about, I guess, started me thinking about quantum computing. And um, then I saw, then Umesh Lazarani came and gave a talk at Bell Labs about his paper with Ethan Bernstein, where they had this, um, I guess, um, problem that was really quite contrived about um, you could do it better on a quantum computer than you could do it on a classical computer. And um, I am trying, I should look at that problem again to see exactly what it was but it's vaguely connected with a quantum Fourier transform, but I don't think they actually did the quantum Fourier transform. I think I was the first person to <clears throat> do the quantum Fourier. Well, so Dan Simon's algorithm does what is effectively the quantum Fourier transform over the group um, Z2 to the N, but um, that is much easier than doing the quantum transform over a cyclic group. And for the discrete log, you needed to do the quantum Fourier transform over a cyclic group. So I figured that out. And you know, based on a vague analogy with Dan Simon's algorithm, and then I figured out how you could use that to um, take discrete logs. So did you have any papers before on quantum? I mean, I see you mentioned that you were thinking about that but you gave up on that problem. So did you have any paper related to this area before? No, no, that was like the factoring algorithm was my first paper on quantum computing. I mean, great. So that, so there were some of these works, but I think uh, you were reading and thinking about it, but that was the uh, first thing. And uh, uh, great. So, uh, I, and I think the story was again, very interesting. And actually I'm very happy that you gave actually quite, uh, I mean, credit to uh, Dan Simon for that. That's actually, that was interesting because it was a few years ago, I was like in Amazon, I think. Uh, and there was, a, a, I think Dan uh, Simon, currently he's a principal uh, scientist at Amazon. He was at Microsoft and other, that's my understanding. <laughs> and right. he actually uh, came and give um, I mean, a talk and say, this is the, 
I mean, uh, Dan Simon's giving a talk about how the first quantum algorithm has been done. And it was actually a bit, I mean, challenging for me, I mean, because I knew that about Shor's algorithm. I couldn't connect, I mean, how come he had that one before and was it correct or something? But uh, actually your video uh, cleared that issue to me that actually he had, I think he had a, a good credit in these things as well because he initiated uh, this one. And of course, I think one important thing I want to say that this is the theoretical computer science. Any result that you will see, I mean, one person may get the, I mean, like, uh, uh, get the actual problem solved, but there are lots of uh, small, small results, or some of them maybe not that small, but you will, you need to use all of them such that you will reach to the, this uh, top of the mountain. And uh, I think uh, it was, uh, I mean, nice a story that you mentioned. Do you want to add anything on that? I mean, about the, I try to give it some short version of that, but any more uh, history or? Well, I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, I've already, you know, talked about this in my, um, I guess, talk for the, um, you know, the 40th anniversary of the Physical Computation Conference. Um, so, I could, you know, say the same thing again if you want, or we could say something else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I think if you want to add anything more, I mean, that... Uh, so I, I think I had some interesting things actually here that was historically but important. And of course, I mean, nowadays, this concept of counting the number of stock box papers, or like sort of access stock papers maybe nowadays, uh, to get a tenure or you get a good job. It's it's actually interesting that nowadays that exists if you are working on theoretical computer science or if you, I, I would say probably if you are doing on other type of things like maybe doing ML, then they will count, I don't know, NURIPS and ICML or something like this. And, but uh, this concept, it is interesting that back that time also it was like that because at that time, I think mathematics was based on more like journal papers. And computer science was somehow innovative <laughs> field that com conferences become very important there. And it's interesting even at the beginning, I mean, it was so important to have papers in these conferences. Right, well, computer science comes out of engineering in some sense. Well, I mean, I, maybe I shouldn't say that because co computer science you know, developed in EE departments, in um, math departments, and um, grew out of both fields. But in engineering, conference papers are incredibly important. So that aspect of the um, culture, that is where computer science gets that aspect of the culture from. Whereas in mathematics, um, journal papers are important and they don't actually have these, you know, juried conference pa conferences where, you know, 300 people submit their papers and 80 of them get in or something like that. Yeah. I mean, the mathematics, most mathematics conferences, everybody who submits a paper gets in up to- Yeah, to, I think, that, and that's more presentation, I will say, not proceedings in some sense that we have it. Yeah, I mean, in the um, joint math conferences, the important papers are all invited, not contributed, and then you have these, um, you have these special sessions, and each of these special sessions has a leader, and the leader asks twenty people from, you know, that area to give talks, and if you're uh, you know, and you can contribute a paper and say, I'd like to present it in the special session. And then they, you know, special session leader looks at it. And if it's good, they'll accept it to their special session. And if it's not, which is usually what happens, they will reject it and it will be put in the contributed sessions. And the contributed sessions are 10 minutes. The special sessions are 20, 25 minutes. The um, invited papers are, you know, 50 minutes or an hour. 
Yeah, uh, but uh, but I think the the main difference is that you don't get I mean that much I mean like uh, they they don't count the number of conferences that you have been happy. They will count your number of uh, like the, the journal papers that I think they have in uh, annals of math or I mean a few other <laughs> top yeah, journals. There are like five. There are five very prestigious journals in math, and maybe they can. Well, I mean, all of this is you know, an oversimplification, you know, deciding for tenure for computer scientists, they don't really just count your stock and fox papers and that's and that's not the only thing they take into account. But yeah, um, yeah in math, you know, annals of mathematics and um, inventiones, mathematica, and a bunch of other, you know, fewer, yeah. three or four other journals are the top ones, and if you're not in those, it's. Uh, I mean, it paper still counts, but not at, not anywhere near as much. Yeah, I, I, I think actually you're getting a tenure, maybe just maybe one or two papers in annals might be, you know, so probably in uh, computer science. I mean, you need many more for, <laughs> like. Stock Fox or so the papers too. Much easier to get a paper into Stock and Fox than it is to get in to I, analytics I agree. mathematics, though. Yes, yeah, I completely agree. So that's like the, uh, I mean, I, I think it became more competitive nowadays, of course, and it has been always, but uh, interesting. And uh, so uh, that's, I think, the story. So we talk about it. So let's talk a little bit about, I mean, quantum computation and, I mean, short of course in particular, maybe give a bit more details. So uh, I think like what's the difference between classic and uh, quantum computers? We have bits versus qubits, uh, essentially one of the main difference. And the other, uh, I think uh, the circuits are a bit different. We don't have this and or uh, not gate. We have similar things. <clears throat> like I think uh, we you have we have uh, like uh, not we have this uh, we have these operations and uh, like something like maybe control uh, not or something like this. So do you want to go a little bit? I mean, talk about I mean, <clears throat> yeah. Well, I mean, one of the big differences between um, quantum computing and classical computing is the state space. So if you have n bits in classical computing, you have two to the n possible combinations of these bits. If you have n bits and qubits in quantum computing, you have a vector space of dimension two to the n. And you can ask how many partially distinguishable states are there in this vector space of two to the n, a size to the, a dimension two to the n, and the answer is two to the two to the n. Two to the two. If you ask for states to be- <clears throat> Zero one. I mean, if you ask for states to be, you know, reasonably distinguishable, and that is, you know, a huge state space. But then you can also ask, um, how much information can you get out of uh, quantum state space of dimension two to the n. And the answer is you can only get out n bits. So these are huge state spaces that can contain a lot more stuff that looks like information, but most of it you can't extract. So this is um, no, completely non-intuitive. And um, this is one of the reasons it's so hard to find algorithms in quantum computing. So what you have to do to get an algorithm, and the other thing about quantum computing is you can have interference. So you have, um, you can, okay, so there's a way of thinking about quantum computers, which is similar to the Feynman path integral. In the Feynman path integral, you look over all paths that a particle can take from point A to point B, and each of them has an amplitude you add all the amplitudes and then square it to get the probability that the particle goes from point A to point B. So in quantum computer, you can look at each path, all these different paths through the computational um, 
I guess, through the computation. And you each of these paths has an amplitude. You add them all up. And then you square this number to get the probability that the computer ends up in that state. And uh, great, yeah. And to, so the way to get quantum algorithms that work better than classical algorithms is you somehow have to make all these paths to the computer interfere. So the probability of getting the wrong answer is close to zero and the probability of getting the right answer all of these paths that take you to the right answer have the same, I guess, sign. So you add them all up and they sum to something close to one. And then you square it, you get probably near one of getting the right answer. Uh, great. So I think like the main difference, as, as you mentioned, this is these two things I try to get, I mean, like summary of this, that you have these qubits, which are just vectors, Versus, I mean, like we have in the classic one is zero one, it's easy to grasp. But here we have the vectors and uh, these vectors, I mean, like can be two dimension or can be N dimensions. Uh, so, and all of these operations are operations that you are working with the vectors. And I think as you mentioned, we have all this information in some sense, uh, this computation that we have, it happens simultaneously. I think this is the concept of parallelism in uh, quantum computation that in all these vectors in parallel, you can do the operation. But at the end, the issue is that, I mean, this, uh, I mean, the, somehow the uh, amplitude or like the value of, I mean, each of these things might be too small that we cannot get that much, we cannot extract that much information. The, the main thing is that how can we do this operation such that some vectors have higher essentially strengths, I will say, and from those, we can get somehow the output of our program. So does it, I think that's like somehow the general idea of the... <coughs> yeah, uh, excuse getting me. This. Uh, yeah, I think take your... Yeah, so yeah, that's essentially the idea. <coughs> uh, great. And uh, so uh, I think also one other interesting thing is that uh, like the general... Uh, if you consider it like a classic computer, think from these bits that you are giving, first you need to generate these vectors, do some operations on them. At the end, from these vectors, we need to extract something and yeah. uh, get the uh, result out of it. Uh, great. And so uh, I think if we have this concept of entanglement, also you want to add a little bit to that. So entanglement is this, um idea that if you have a quantum, if you have a classical state and you have a microscope, you can look at this classical state closely and that will tell you everything about the particles that are in this classical state, say. Now in quantum mechanics, you can have two particles that are a long way from each other and they can be entangled, which means that if you take this particle alone and you look at it, it's, you will never get the complete information because this particle, these two particles share entanglement and it's only by looking at the both of them together that you can find the com complete joint state space. And, so, great. and this particle, it might be the other side of the world. So we may not even have access to that. Right, so these particles can be very, very far apart. And Einstein, did not like this concept. And he called it spooky action at a distance. Yeah. And he wrote a paper with Podolsky and Rosen saying that because of this concept that you know this particle has properties that are, you know, are not present in its local description in quantum mechanics, but are present somehow with both of the, you know, if you look at these particles together, then this particle, you know, then, you know, because it has these property, properties that quantum mechanics does not explain, quantum mechanics must be incomplete and there must be some bigger theory that explains these properties. And so, uh, he wrote, so, he wrote this, so he wrote this paper and, um, you know, Bohr 
wrote a response to this paper, which said, well, if you read the response carefully, it's, you know, it says that quantum mechanics is complete, that nothing else can, you know, there isn't any other bigger theory which will explain entanglement. And, but it isn't really, um, no, but, it, you know, it's, if you look, read it closely, it looks, it seems like a lot of hand waving to me. Uh, so, it, um, so uh, let me actually ask a question because that was one of the things that I was, I mean, reading some books and others about uh, this. So, uh, uh, do you think that it still is possible that quantum, essentially mechanics or quantum, I mean, computing is yes, based on that is part of the things that we like it's part of the truth and there are some more general theorem that can explain that so what you're thinking about them yeah well i mean so um i don't know if you've read um douglas adams books um hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy and the sequels um but somewhere in that you know he says that um, if anybody ever figures out the theory of the universe, it's instantly replaced by a new and much more complicated theory. So what I want to say is if we do find a theory which goes beyond quantum mechanics, then it's not going to explain things more simply. It's going to explain things much more complicatedly. Uh, I think that is um, somehow... Part of this theory of everything of, I mean, like Stephen Hawking that I think he was talking about that. And that's actually interesting that, it, and I think it is, uh, so as you mentioned, so I think from Newton to Einstein, actually the theories become much more complicated. And from there again to quantum, it became more complicated. So I think that's interesting view that we are actually going to more complicated <laughs> world. Yeah. I don't know, is there any simplification at some point? Maybe these are like the proof that becomes complicated proof. Somebody comes with a short proof that can actually explain everything. Yeah. Yeah. But the, I mean, the thing is that quantum mechanics lets you do quantum computation. And this somehow, you know, runs much faster than any classical computation. The computer would do so. Classical computer might need 10 to the 50th steps to do something that a quantum computer can do in a few billion. So um, if you're building, if you're trying to build quantum mechanics on a classical theory underneath, you have to explain how this classical theory can solve these problems that it seems like no classical um, computer can do. So the classical theory underneath needs something more than just local determinism to solve it. So, I mean, I had this um, discussion, I think, on <clears throat> You know, stack exchange physics with um, Gerard Tuft, and he um, and you know, I said that there were three possibilities. One, that a complete description of an n-dimensional or an n-particle system is going to take two to the n um, space or B, there's some kind of non-locality, or um, there was a third possibility, but um, none of these is actually, you know, compatible with a simple description of something broader than quantum mechanics. It still needs to have a lot of the same um, paradoxes. On the other mm. hand, I think quantum mechanics really is probably not the right answer because nobody has succeeded in reconciling quantum mechanics with gravity so far. Exactly. And there are some real um, <clears throat> fundamental obstacles to that. And one of them is that the 
classical theory of general relativity says if you throw something into a black hole, the information in it vanishes completely. Whereas quantum mechanics says that information never vanishes. Never vanishes. So you can ask, well, when the black hole evaporates, does the information come out? And physicists generally think the answer is yes. And then you can ask them how, how and they have no clue. Yeah. So um, it's... Yeah, I think this issue that you mentioned, like the gravity and quantum mechanics, these are two things that they still have not been <laughs> married together essentially, and they have a somehow conflicting uh, things. Now, uh, great. So uh, going back actually to uh, short algorithm. So uh, that's... <laughs> So uh, the idea is uh, uh, here that you are using this concept of <clears throat> uh, parallelism that exists somehow in quantum uh, to find the period of I, this function, I think, uh, is c to the x mod uh, n, uh, if I remember correctly. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, and uh, so, Maybe you want to give a little bit I mean, more details into that, I think, for the... Yeah, so I guess there are two parts of the factoring algorithm. The first part is completely classical and says if you can find the period of this function, c to the x mod n, <coughs> which if n is, you know, if n has... Um, L bits, it's going to be exponential. The period is going to be exponential in L. So it's, um, there's more, I mean, so this period of this function is long enough that you'll never be able to even write down the entire length of this um, function on a classical computer to find the period. So that's the first part. If you can find the period, you can factor. And the second part is you can use the quantum period finding algorithm to find the period. And the quantum period finding algorithm uses the quantum Fourier transform, which, <clears throat> so if you know anything about Fourier transforms, they find periods. So the Fourier transform just takes a uh, series and breaks it down into the sum of sine waves, which, <clears throat> are essentially different, you know, various frequencies that combine to make this entire function. So you can use the Fourier transform to find periods, but the problem is that you cannot, you know, you cannot use the classical Fourier transform to find the period of the sequence because it's too long to even keep in the memory of your classical computers. But the nice thing about quantum computing is that a quantum state space has a lot of room in it. So it's a true to the n dimensional space. So there's really room for two to the two to the n possible values of things. And so you can represent the sequence in a quantum computer. Now, you cannot extract all the information of the sequence in a quantum computer because you can only extract you know, you can't extract more bits than the dimension of the quantum state space. Fantastic. However, you can extract um, information that you couldn't get with a classical computer. And one of the things you can extract is the period. And we do this by using the, you know, quantum Fourier transform. <clears throat> and, uh, let's see. So we can't, you know, we can't get the quantum Fourier transform because that's also an exponentially long sequence, but we can sample from the quantum Fourier transform. And if you do it right, a random sample of, uh, so the quantum Fourier, tra when you take the quantum Fourier transform on the computer, some of these um, values are going to have much larger amplitudes than the other values. So you'll only see values that have very large amplitudes and if you do this right, then most of the values that you're likely to see will be able to give you the period of a sequence. 
Uh, great. And I think uh, this is the one. Uh, uh, Peter, and I, I think you mentioned, uh, I want to just add that like this is the classic part, I think, that this function that we consider f of x is c to the x mod n and for some random c. And this, I think this is the periodicity of this function that we are talking about. That if you are doing for different x, say, integers, then you see the some... Uh, like a periodic uh, sequence essentially happens. And if you find this periodic city, the uh, periodic uh, number, then actually we can factor n. And factoring means that finding uh, say, uh, this n, you want to find the prime factor such that if you multiply them, then you can get it. And also that is very crucial. I mean, why we care about this function and factoring in particular, because that's the base of, uh, uh, almost all uh, security that we are using, RSA and lots of other things are based on this uh, factoring. And so far we assume that classic computers cannot do that, so we are safe. But if quantum computers can break it, then it would be actually, <laughs> I say is quite, uh, quite a bit of chaos. And I should add actually, this, is, this was a very nice and uh, I mean, uh, Peter mentioned it in a nice and <laughs> clean way, but of course that was a great result that he had it and he got lots of, I mean, prestigious awards like the Nevalina Prize, which is the, I, mean, I think now it is called the uh, Abacus uh, and the uh, medal. And this is like fields in uh, theory of computer science and like a Godel Prize and a MacArthur Genius Award. So these are all very uh, nice. <laughs> I mean, awards to have given these nice results that uh, Peter uh, initiated. Uh, great. So uh, that's, uh, I think we gave uh, some ideas about this. Now, uh, let me ask, uh, I mean, as you mentioned, I mean, get, these working with these vectors are hard. And that's an interesting thing. I mean, you had this result, I, uh, I think it was 94 that published in Fox. Uh, then it was a SciCom paper in, in 1997. Uh, and then it's, I think two years later, Grover had, and by the way, this, I think that was a very important result. The, I mean, the fact that Peter mentioned that we, ha we can, this two to the N or two to the, two to the, two to the N space is something that we can use it and we can get something that if you want to do in the classic one, currently we need two to the N. But here in some sense in polynomial time, we can, do the factorization. So we have some kind of uh, exponential speed up for factoring. I mean, given that if we are assuming that P not equal P is not equal to MP and factorization cannot be done in polynomial time. Still, we don't know the answer to that problem. And uh, factorization is one of the things actually it is not in, N in NP, it's between P and NP. So uh, still it's possible actually P is not equal to MP and factorization it can be done in polynomial. Then, uh, so there was an exponential speed up that happened. But then uh, there is this uh, Grover search algorithm that uh, here we are having essentially n numbers. If you want to see whether your number is one of these n numbers, I mean, in the classic one, you need to see almost, you should need to see all of them. If you want to do randomized, you need to see at least half of them in expectations, such that you will see whether number is there or not. Grover, I mean, but that the algorithm that he used quantum uh, 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 computations to get it SQR root of n. So even with SQR root of n props, we can actually see whether your number is there or not. And there are several things that is built on that. For example, there is this uh, a quantum random box which somehow generalizes Grover and get uh, interesting results. So the first question is that I mean. Uh, I think you can, that uh, if you want, you can, would be great if you just give uh, a little, I mean, more discussion of Grover algorithm. And uh, do you see Grover algorithm as like the somehow generalizing Schwarz algorithm or not? Oh, I think I think Grover's algorithm is quite different from Schwarz algorithm. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, but in, in terms of the ideas, I think, uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so the idea is, um, I mean, in some sense, what you're doing, I mean, there are two ways of 
describing Grover's algorithm. One way is you're rotating a, spate, a state in uh, high dimensional space and you can rotate it. And the state you're rotating is really the superposition of all correct answers plus our alpha, you know, some constant times the superposition of all correct answers plus some other constant times the superposition of all wrong answers until uh, so you start in the superposition of all possible answers and then you rotate it so that it gets closer and closer to the superposition of all correct answers and once you reached this superposition of all correct answers you measure it and you get a random correct answer and this is something which <clears throat> really is impossible to have a classical analog of because you know there's no way you know if you have a random <clears throat> if you have a random point there's no way to make it to give more um weight to it if it's a correct answer rather than a wrong answer so this is um really a very um I'm going to say it's a very mysterious property of one of them computing. Uh, great. So I think th that's the one that you mentioned. I think here we are talking about, I think uh, this was the good and bad state or correct incorrect states that yeah. uh, 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 Peter mentioned that, I mean, if you have, I mean, some sequence, like you have array of size n, and I say i is the one that, like the i's position is the one that you are looking for it and the good state is the case that i mean you will i will give you this i and the bad states are all other positions and i think as you mentioned this kind of rotating ideas that you are doing and instead of n you can do it as your root of n rotations such that you will find the correct one if it uh, exists like in search uh, uh great so uh, do you see any i mean con uh, so you don't see any way that i mean like uh, uh, or I, I don't know maybe somebody else use for example uh, this fourier quantum fourier to get the same result are there such results or these two are somehow two different from two different worlds um i haven't thought about using quantum fourier transform to get grover's algorithm but offhand, I don't see how to do it. I don't think anybody else has figured out how to do it either. Uh, great. But uh, I mean, I know that I mean, some of this theory, like uh, I mentioned, like for example, quantum random box, that's a nice result that built on that and as a, that can actually is more general, but it can give also this uh, Grover search things. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think these two still are somewhat disconnected. Short algorithm versus, and uh, has he talked with you? I mean, before, or I mean, he just came, I mean, or you, you just saw this paper came, and that's interesting. Oh, um, he talked to me at Bell Labs, and um, I didn't give him any ideas for this algorithm. He just came up with it all by himself, and he talked to me about it before he published it, and it worked. And um, I have no idea how he discovered it. <laughs> uh, great. So, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, getting a new algorithm in quantum actually is very hard. I think uh, this is, I guess, this is a complicated <laughs> area, I will say, and getting a nice algorithm is uh, a bit hard. Uh, so, there is another one, I mean, HHL, I think that was in 2009, I think, uh, Haro, uh, uh, I think. Uh, forgot the, the middle name and Lloyd. Uh, that was, uh, they have this idea that how can we solve a system of equation like AX equal to B using quantum, but there are several conditions that they have it, like they have this kind of well conditioned. I mean, the initial state should be prepared well. And I mean, I think one more conditions. And uh, so I think that's maybe the third algorithm like first, I mean, do you agree that this is like the uh, third algorithm, or uh, are there other algorithms that has been developed and like in the quantum world, like a famous and like Grover and short algorithm? And uh, in particular, I mean, Grover, the issue as I mentioned, it is like polynomial speed up, which is still very important, but of course, exponential speed up would be much better. 
So yeah, so go ahead. So I guess HHL, the problem is that, well, I mean, if you have a, if you have a linear equation that you can write down, you can solve it with a classical computer. <clears throat> so what you have to do for H, I mean, what you need for HHL really to be useful is to have a huge linear equation, which you can somehow represent implicitly in quantum memory. And then you can find the, you know, then you can find the solution to this again, implicitly in quantum memory, and you can sample from the solution. And so this only works if you have, you know, not just a matrix and a vector, which is what you would usually need for typically you have problem, but you need uh, not a matrix, but a way to generate every um, entry of the matrix. And you need not a vector, but a way to generate every element of vector. And, you know, with this, you can represent exponential size matrices and vectors, and then you can get, well, I don't want to say the solution, you can get the solution represented as a superposition in your quantum memory. And then hopefully this is what you want to, hopefully this can give you the, the results that you want. The results that you actually want to find. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, I think uh, to be clear, so this works if the matrix is huge. So we want to, if we can represent this huge matrix in quantum states, then we can possibly sample, I mean, get some uh, superpositions. And from that, we can sample some solutions for that. So if the right. input matrix is huge, then that's actually the way to get the results. And yeah. uh, so I think it's like, I will say it's not as clean as uh, like Shor's or Crow. Uh, algorithm, but I think that's a good progress. Is there anything else, I mean, after these ones that has well, happened? I think, that... I think you can probably represent um, the quantum Fourier transform as an instance of HHL because the Fourier transform matrix is just a huge matrix. And the thing that you're trying to apply it to, which is the you know, this exponentially long sequence you're trying to find the period of is just a vector. So you can represent the quantum Fourier transform as HHL. So this yeah. is one. Some of that generalization of uh, short idea. Yeah. Uh, great. And uh, also there is this uh, quantum random box. So that also, I would say pro that's more generalization of Grover search idea. Yeah, it is. So, yeah. And there are some interesting you know, results about quantum random walks that you can, that people have, um, you know, found. Uh, I think we can also do exponential speed up there, but not for that much natural problem. We can get uh, something for shortest path, or uh, I think some of the other problems uh, that you can actually get, but that is polynomial speed up. Exponential is still not a <laughs> like very natural well, you, problem. You can get an exponential speed up for quantum random walks, but it's not a natural problem. Not a natural problem. Yeah, uh, I think in that sense, I mean, the, 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 for example, we use actually this, uh, we had this paper about the, uh, it was at Google, and uh, they were talking about map reduce. And uh, this is like, you know, this is a spark or other that they are doing that's a parallel computers to solve the problem. We had this paper actually for edit distance. It was in the classic computer was, uh, n square was needed. I mean, to get, a, a, so the question that, can we get any constant factor approximation for edit distance? Finding the edit bit, two strings are given to you, you want to, by deletion uh, or additions or replacement, you want to ch change one string to another. And you want the minimum number of these operations. We used actually, uh, this we general we designed an algorithm. So it was an open problem. Can we do in classic computers? Can we do it a constant factor approximation, like constant factor approximation for the number of moves that we can turn one into the other in sub uh, uh, quadratic time? So we could actually uh, do this one using uh, quantum 
computers. And we were thinking also about the map reduce. So interestingly, this concept of parallelism that exists in the Spark or others, the same type of like similar to the quantum one, we could actually get this result in quantum. We could uh, uh, do it using the Grover search idea. That was important. I mean, the idea. But interestingly, there were several steps here. We could get like three, four steps. We could get the first three actually the classic. The last one we needed Grover search to do that. And later on, it turned out that you don't need actually Grover search. You can also do the last step in the quantum on the classic one. And this was actually a paper that we had this one, the last one, I think, they did got best paper award in Fox. And we both had our papers in JCM. So the, that's interesting that for lots of this problem, you need to be careful that you may think that quantum is very important, but some of them actually you can't do it even without quantum. And that's right. the thing that makes it essentially hard to get something which is genuinely hard uh, for regular computers. Like for example, search, we know that you cannot do better than omega n, but in quantum you can do SQL root of n and you cannot do also better than SQL root of n. So, or uh, I think we were using something uh, more recently for quantum consensus, but again, the idea somehow is similar to Grover uh, ideas of this kind of uh, rotation type of things. So in some sense, uh, I mean, we are, have this field, I don't know, for maybe around 30 years or so, still, I mean, not too many algorithms that we have it there. And uh, so uh, let, I think the other area also that is has been active about quantum uh, coding. Again, you are talking uh, more in that video that you had it, but you want to say some words about the quantum uh, uh, coding theory and error correcting code in particular. For right, so I guess when I published my factoring algorithm, one big objection, which I guess Rolf Landauer made was that <clears throat> These are never going to work because they're always, you know, any actual physical device you build is going to be inaccurate. And um, so suppose you want to do a billion steps on a quantum computer, which is what you need to um, say factor a cryptographically significant number, then you need to do each step with accuracy one part in a billion. And this is absolutely hopeless in terms of experimental physics. So I started thinking about this. In classical computing, there are a bunch of ways you can get around this. And von Neumann showed in 1955 or so that you can do classical computation with unreliable components, but still do the computation completely reliably. And there are various number of techniques you use to make classical computers more reliably reliable. One is checkpointing, where you write down the state of the computer. One is massive redundancy, where you have, you know, five copies of every bit and you compare them against each other. And if one of them is wrong, you correct them. And one of them is error correcting codes. So you can look and see whether any of these work quantum mechanically. And the first checkpointing doesn't work because there's this thing called the no cloning theorem that says you cannot duplicate the state of a quantum computer. So you have your computer and what you want to do is you want to write down its state and then keep on computing. You can't do that, that's you can't do that. cloning. And now there's massive redundancy and in massive redundancy, you know, so suppose you have five copies of every bit around. At some point, one of them um, goes wrong. So now you only have four copies of the computation. So what you need to do now is take these four copies of the computation and with them, get five correct copies of the computation. You can't do that. The no cloning theorem says you cannot make four copies and do five copies. It's not quite cloning, but the theorem still applies. So the last one is error correcting codes. And that looks like it doesn't work, but it actually works. So you have um, you have your you know you want to take a bit and you want to encode it in some number of other bits. So suppose you take 
So suppose you take a zero. The simplest classical error correcting code is a repetition code. You just make it three zeros. And now if you get a state which is corrupted, say zero, mm -hmm. one, zero, well, the chances are it's a zero because you only have one error, then it came from zero, zero, zero. If you had two errors, then it would have come from one, zero, what, or from one, one, one. one. That's much less likely. And if you don't like this probability, you can just make it, um, I guess, 17, take one zero and represent everything by 17 zeros. And then you need to flip nine bits to make it incorrect. And if you keep on comparing your bits during your computation, there is no way that you're gonna ever get nine bits incorrect unless something like lightning hits your computer or something. Yeah. So this is what von Neumann's um, paper said, that you can do um, quantum, that you could do classical computation reliably with unreliable components by using massive redundancy. Now, you can't do this in quantum compute. You can't do exactly the same thing in quantum computing mm -hmm. because you take zero and turn it into zero, zero, zero. You also need to correct phases rather than bits. So you can take, if you have a state, which is a supervision of zero and one, so one over root two, zero plus one, then when you apply this encoding system, you get one over root two, zero, 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 plus one over root two, one, one, one. And now if you make a bit error where you take a zero and flip it to a one, that's correctable. If you take make a bit a phase error where you take a zero to a zero and a one to a minus one, that is actually three times as likely to flip the logical qubit phase yeah. and the physical qubit phase for that encoding. On the other hand, <clears throat> there's also this Hadamard transform, which takes bit flips to phase flips and phase flips to bit flips. So now you can make a code which can correct any phase error, but is three times as likely to make a bit error. And what you do to make a code that corrects both is you use a concatenated code. So first you encode your qubit zero, your qubit with a, you know this bit error correcting code, and then you encode each of the resulting three bits with a phase error correcting code. And now you have one bit encoded one bit into nine bits and you can correct any single error on any single bit. And I think the best one is this one to nine has been improved to seven and five, correct? Yeah, it has. But um, those are much more complicated codes. But... Um, and do we have any bound that less than four, five is not possible? Less than five is not possible, no. Okay, so five is the optimum. Right, but I mean, what you can do is you can take k qubits and embed them in n qubits, and as k and n go get large, you can, um, you know, you can embed a, you know, if you have a constant error rate, say one in ten, maybe. Um, then as k and n get large, you can keep the ratio k over n constant and find longer and longer codes with, you know, where you bet, take k bits and embed them in n bits with k over n maybe, um, okay, I'm, I'm going to get the number right. <laughs> number wrong, but if the error rate is say one over a hundred, you can find codes where you take k bits and you embed them into n bits and k over n is very close to one, maybe 0. 0.9. And yeah. you can still correct errors in this case. Yeah, so, so I think, I mean, I, I, I think my understanding is this one that say, I mean, like if you want to just do one 
qubit essentially then we may go to five essentially right that is needed but uh, if we have more than one if we have k of them then we may use more like in some other combination of them and then when we embed them into n bits this n over k that ratio can go to one in the infinity so yeah. that's uh, somehow if you are using more bits we can use more correlation of them and get it more efficient things right. but one to five is the optimum one yeah so um but so this will let you take your qubits, put them in memory, and get them out without too much inefficiency. But the problem is, suppose you have, you know, so that would work if you have um, memory errors, but you also have gate errors. So the circuit you use to encode these qubits and the circuit you use to restore them are going to give you extra errors. So what you need to do is you need to find some code which <clears throat> you can correct errors even when your gates are noisy. And that's actually much harder. So um, I proved the first theorems about this and I didn't get the um, optimal result, but then, you know, Dorit Aharonov and Michael Benor improved on my result. And they showed that if you have, if your error rate is one in say, well, if your error rate is one in a hundred thousand, this is what they proved, then you can actually um, compute for arbitrarily long and only have a polynomial overhead. So instead of using N gates, you can use N to the, 2.5 gates. Uh, great. And, and this is, um, wait. No, you can use n times log n to the 2.5 gates. And so this was their result. But um, and it's been improved then. That, I mean, now the real result is if you have say one in a thousand or one in 10,000 error rate, you can still do quantum computing. The problem is that the worse the error rate, the more overhead you need. So um, if you, you know, so if you have a one in 10,000 error rate, you might need to replace every original qubit with a thousand qubits which is really quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, great. So, uh, okay, so actually there was uh, one question that I think we kind of answered that, say, what do you, uh, this is like, uh, he asked, uh, what do you, uh, what you will say about uh, Einstein uh, unacceptable towards uh, Schrodinger's theory? I think somehow we discussed that, but. Do you want to add anything more to that? But what was the question? I, didn't uh, I think he said that, I mean, what, I think uh, like this is the sentence he said that, uh, what will you say about Einstein unacceptable towards uh, Schrodinger's theory? Oh, well, Einstein was, well, first Schrodinger was actually on Einstein's side. So Schrodinger's cat was this reductio ad absurdum example of why, you know, Bohr's Copenhagen theory of physics was really um, not completely correct. <clears throat> so Schrodinger was with um, Einstein in not completely liking um, the standard um, quantum mechanics formalism. But Bohr and others, like I think Heisenberg and um, I'm trying to remember who else was in the early um, days of quantum mechanics thought that, you know, quantum mechanics was right and they didn't need to worry about um, this Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, um, well, um, paper that says that quantum mechanics cannot be a ro local realistic theory because, um, well, um, 
it's really hard to say what Bohr thought because he um, didn't really express himself, but he you know his idea was that there really isn't any actual um, microscopic quantum world and quantum theory is just a set of rules to come up with probabilities for what's going to happen in a macroscopic world is one interpretation of the things he said. I'm not entirely sure that the things he said were all consistent, but um, I mean, he may have changed his um, views over time, although he never actually admitted it. I see. But um, so um, right now, okay, so I've done some, I participated in physics stack exchange a little bit, and there are a lot of people who still, you know, still say, well, quantum mechanics. Well, I mean, there's, there are people who say, and I'll be controversial when I say this, you know, in quantum mechanics, there are things called virtual photons and there are things called real photons. And people will say there's a sharp division between virtual photons and real photons. Virtual photons don't actually exist and real photons exist. But in fact, um, there's not a sharp distinction. There's, uh, I mean, virtual photons are only around for, um, you know, say, um, gigaseconds. Um, sorry, ductoseconds, you know, very, very small amount of time possibly. And as the amount of time gets longer, at some point, you stop saying that this photon is virtual and you start admitting that it's real. But there's no sharp distinction imaginable. I mean, most, you know, most particle physics experiments, they have colliders. If a photon actually makes it out of the collider to a de detector, it's obviously real. And if a photon, you know, stays in the collider, you know, does not make it out of the collider, but stays in this, um, you know, little, little area around the collision, then it's virtual. But, and you know, this sets, uh, you know, this sets a distinction between virtual photons and real photons, but really there's no reason that a photon has to either stay within microns of where it was formed or go out meters away before it's detected, there could be um, photons that last for intermediate times. So this- um, So still they are building the theory essentially. And I think that like somehow <laughs> makes this one uh, consistent, this conflicting theories. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, let's actually go and uh, like uh, talk a little bit about the practicality of quantum. <clears throat> so uh, of course, there's, uh, when we talk about uh, quantum computations, <clears throat> this error that you mentioned is a very important one. And I think this, I was talking actually with some of other colleagues about this. And this error that when you try to make this qubit, the error that propagates such that we cannot do the actual uh, computation that we want is a big issue. And I think uh, it was until a few years ago, we had like maybe three, four qubits has been built. But now maybe Google, I think, has 60, 70 qubits. And uh, so, uh, now talk about the practicality. So one thing is, uh, I think at quantum mechanics, there are several applications of like quantum mechanics. Am I right on that? Real world practical applications of quantum mechanics. Um, you mean quantum computing or quantum mechanics? Quantum mechanics, yeah. Oh, there are zillions of applications of quantum mechanics. I mean, lasers are quantum mechanical. Um, that's probably the most, um, all sorts of sensors are quantum mechanical. Um, so, uh, there are lots of, yeah, I mean, quantum mechanics is everywhere. So, so that error that exists somehow inherently there, that does not prevent them to make any, I mean, like 
they can still use use it and make it. So can you give some intuition that why this is not an issue there versus quantum computation, which is an issue? Well, I mean, so quantum computation, the problem is that you need to control both the amplitude and the phase of your qubits. So you need to you need to take zero to zero, one to one, zero plus one to zero plus one, and zero minus one to zero minus one, and make sure all of, all of these things. If you have a laser, what happens is that your amplitude errors are, I mean, the amplitude of your laser, which means the intensity of the light is really big, and you don't care whether there's a phase error. So you don't care whether your laser is, um, actually, this isn't quite true, but you don't care how much of a phase error your laser has. I mean, you do need your, I mean, in an experiment like LIGO, you do need your error, your laser to have a very high amplitude and to, for its phase to be very accurate, but um, you know, there's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says that you can't get both of them very, very small, but it doesn't matter because LIGO is within the current, um, you know, the current um, experimental errors or both of these is um, small enough to detect, um, you know, black holes colliding. Yeah, uh, so, uh, uh, great. Uh, uh, and can you just define, I mean, uh, this uh, amplitude error and phase error maybe a bit uh, um, more? Well, I mean, um, that's a good question. So the phase error is the one that we do operations and we want to, if something is correct, then after that it is correct. Am I right? The phase, well, um, I mean, so in a quantum computer, an amplitude error is a zero flipping to a one or one flipping to a zero. A phase error is a zero plus one flipping to a zero minus one and vice versa. If you have a laser, what you have is a state of the light field, which is a harmonic oscillator, and now amplitude errors and phase errors are, well, are a little bit, are defined a little bit differently. So, but, um, and in fact, the quantum limits set, um, okay, I don't understand this very well, but the quantum limits set, um, set, um, bounds on how well LIGO can operate. And they're thinking of using, you know, ideas from quantum computation to improve LIGO and get below these limits. So actually quantum computation may, our ideas from quantum computation may be useful in terms of seeing gravity waves. And great. So uh, that's actually interesting. So in some sense, I mean, my understanding is this one, this phase error, or I mean, like in, for example, in the laser one, we are using more like one shot type of use of quantum. But when we talk about quantum computation, when we have these quantum circuits, and uh, then it, the whole information should go, I mean, through lots of operations and making sure that the final error is a small, that's the one that makes it essentially hard. Yeah, that's right. Uh, great. Okay. So that actually, uh, I think that was a nice uh, intuition that I mean, why it can be used there. Now, uh, coming back to quantum computation. So I was like, for example, with Amazon, I mean, they won. Uh, nowadays, they have this uh, cloud computing. I think this Google, Azure, uh, Microsoft for Microsoft, and AWS for Amazon. Uh, and uh, so these are like the major ones. Of course, there are several other. So one idea that we can potentially use quantum computation is that, I mean, the people are using these computers and for some of their services. So I assume, for example, if we can solve this, uh, I mean, large matrices essentially in a very efficient way for this 
system of like ax equal to b this system of equations one idea would be that you have i mean essentially a procedure that it is implemented in one of these clouds you will call it and that one instead of using essentially classic one it use a quantum one and make it much faster gives the results much faster this is actually very similar again to this map reviews or a spark ideas that they have it they have doing this <clears throat> so if you want to do something faster, you are using a Spark. It runs on several computers such that it gives the results to them. So that would be a natural way that, I mean, we may use it. But the question is that, I mean, how far are we from that point, essentially? And of course, one other level is that the whole computer, my <laughs> um, laptop and your laptop, all of them are quantum and faster. So uh, how far are we from that place like maybe using it on cloud by big companies and also the next step that my laptop or your laptop all of them become quantum computers well i mean so i mean we're already everybody is already using the clouds i mean if you use google maps yes uh, i don't know how much computation google maps does but certainly the amount of storage that you would need to have google maps on your laptop is probably um, incredible because there's a lot of data in all these maps. Yeah, worse and, than that actually is the YouTube I will mention it. So I think that people may not get the idea that this cloud, how important are they? Because like yeah. we just use the YouTube, like any video that I put it, even if the video is 16 gigabyte, it's still uh, Google keeps a copy of that for me, even though for showing the video that make it com more compressed. So, and you know how many people are putting videos at YouTube and we can save and none of them will be deleted because I mean, if even somebody does not see it for a while, still it is there. So it's amazing. And everyone, as you mentioned, using cloud and uh, like it's already is like a different world, I will say, this cloud versus without cloud, yeah. Well, I mean, with YouTube, do we know how much Google is using clever algorithms to compress the videos, to put them in memory, and then when we, and then they uncompress them before delivering them. Because... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I think they are doing one time thing. So for that one, so they are just getting the, like the big video, maybe 16 gigabytes, then they make it smaller, something around, say I'm talking about maybe two hours video. I have something like maybe six, seven gigabytes, then it turned out into something like six, 700 megabytes. So they okay. turned into this, and then that's the one that they show. But still, they will keep the original one. If you want, you can actually ask them to send it to you. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge, essentially, amount of storage. But, yeah. but, but anyhow, yeah, go ahead. Anyway, yeah. So, um, I mean, all the techniques for quantum computing are really nothing you can put in a laptop. I mean, the superconducting quantum computers need dill fridges and a dill fridge is a very expensive machine. Um, actually, they're getting cheaper now because people are starting to mass produce them, but it's still gonna cost $100,000 or something. <clears throat> and um, you, and they're you know, huge. They're big cylinders. You've probably seen them in pictures of quantum computers. And um, your quantum computer is this little tiny chip inside the middle of this huge dill fridge, which most of the uh, hello, everyone. I think we lost Peter. So Give me a second such as I can I call him and uh, see how is it going.
Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, so we are back. Sorry, I think something happened. So did they run out of battery or something like this? Yeah, my my battery ran down. Yeah, I think I should <laughs> remind people. Yeah, I, I should have connected it with. I, I mean, I I had a hundred percent before we started talking, but it's been two hours, which I guess. <laughs> does, yeah, I think like, why are you for that one? So yeah, we were uh, talking about uh, the real world. Uh, I mean, applications. And as you mentioned, so quantum laptops, you want to say it may take, I mean, forever. And given the current technology, we might be far from that. I think the quantum uh, cloud, that might be possible. So then how many years from now you think that we will have it? I mean, that's well, really hard to say. I mean, it depends on how many breakthroughs you, um, you want to assume. I mean, right now, to get a real quantum computer, you probably need a million physical qubits to get a few thousand logical qubits. And we're at a hundred physical qubits, maybe. And so if you assume they if you assume they double every year, which is very optimistic, it's going to be at least um, 15 years. Yes, so but it's that. quite possible that you can do better than if you get better fault tolerant methods it's quite possible you don't need a million physical qubits and um and so it would be and if someone has really good ideas how to make better physical qubits then it might be faster. Whereas if you, you know, as I say, doubling every year is probably much too optimistic. If you assume doubling every two years, it's probably at least 30 years before you get a, you know, a full scale quantum computer. So. Uh, great. So uh, I think, uh, let me also ask, I mean, from a different aspect, there was some, I mean, I think one of the big news here was this D-Wave company, Canada. I think that was a few years ago. I remember I talked actually with you in one of David Johnson's, uh, I mean, uh, he used to actually ask all people who are currently in at and and or before they were there. And I think we talked about it in one of these parties that he had it every year for Intel. I think that was a great thing that again, we are missing that because we are missing uh, David as well. David Johnson. But uh, so uh, coming back uh, to this issue, there was D-Wave and there was this more recent one about uh, Google. So uh, and do you believe, uh, so uh, like, and there was this uh, idea that, I mean, they were mentioned that like Google is, can do something which regular computers cannot do that. And there was this paper by IBM that said that no, actually at the end, you can do that one maybe a bit, uh, like uh, slower, but still you can do it on uh, regular computers. So uh, going back to this, uh, I mean, like uh, first, is a quantum is a Google one is real quantum supremacy, and what about D wave? Did, did they had any? I mean, like progress in the field? Did they cause any progress? Yeah. Well, D wave was based on the adiabatic model of quantum computing, and. If you want to simulate something from the circuit model to the adiabatic model, you can do it polynomially, but there's a lot of overhead. And the other thing about D-Wave, the adiabatic model, what you want to, what you need to do is you need to, well, you need to start in a, with a, Ham, I mean, so the adiabatic model, you change your Hamiltonian, and you want to start with a Hamiltonian with a known ground state, and you want to change it very slowly until you get to a Hamiltonian whose ground state is a problem you want to solve. And there are theorems that you can do any quantum computation with the adiabatic model, but you need to keep the temperature very low as you're going from the initial start state to the ground, to the final Hamiltonian. And if you look at D-Wave's computer, there was no way that the temperature was low enough not to get any excitations on the way from the initial state to the final state. So it's not actually going to be following the adiabatic quantum path that or at least is not guaranteed to actually follow the adiabatic quantum path, which the theory says will take you to the right answer. 
So you just basically have to hope that you will get to the right answer somehow. And so they did a lot of experiments and, you know, maybe on these experiments, they did things that looked like they were doing them faster than classical computers did, but there wasn't any real evidence that they were doing anything exponentially faster. Exponentially faster. So that's the way and I have yeah, uh, just one quick question. So, uh, did, uh, do they need a qubit there also a large number of qubits or if they want to use this transformation the qubit the number of qubits is not the main issue. Um, well, I mean if they did everything right then the number of qubits well they have several thousand qubits, right? Um, and so if they did everything right, then the number of qubits would be enough to do interesting things. But, you know, this fact that they're, that they know first they have to take their problem and fit it on the um, connectivity of their computer. So if you take an arbitrary problem, then trying to fit it onto their computer's connectivity could be really really expensive. I mean, it's a polynomial overhead, but it's polynomial overheads can be expensive. <laughs> so if you want to take an arbitrary problem and solve it on a D-wave computer, there probably aren't enough qubits. So they were trying to see whether they had speed ups for problems that had the same connectivity as their computer did. And I don't know whether they ever showed anything that was really convincing. No, so I, don't what, know, I don't know what's happened to D-Wave. Are they still in business? Still, I think somebody bought computer? them or something like this. That was the latest thing. I searched like a, maybe not recently, but maybe a year ago and there was, uh, I think they were bought by someone or something like this. Uh, um, let me, I'm gonna Google them. Yeah. Um, doesn't look like it doesn't look like anything's happened um yeah i think they became quiet so <laughs> either i mean bought part of it by some some maybe acqui hired by some other companies or something like this but yeah okay. uh, anyhow so i think that's for the debate now going back to uh Google one. Yeah. So, uh, so Google has a real quantum computer. I mean, uh, no, it has a circuit model quantum computer, which has relatively no noise. And they put this quantum supremacy experiment on it. And they showed that it really, you know, that the noise was really, um, you know, very well characterized. And they, um, show that they got the um, results that the quantum supremacy ex you know, experiment did. Now, I mean, this quantum supremacy experiment. Um, and uh, can you just briefly mention what was the, that experiment, the quantum? Okay, so, if, so the, the theorem is if you have a random um, circuit, then it's, you know, a random circuit is asymptotically hard to simulate by a classical computer. So if you have a random circuit, or at least, sorry, a quantum circuit is hard to simulate by a cl classical computer. If you have a random quantum circuit with the right parameters, they believed that this was hard to simulate by a classical computer. Yeah. And so they built this random circuit and, um, you know, and they got the answer to what, I mean, a random circuit is going to give you a distribution of outputs. They got the right distribution of outputs. So the question is, if you're given a random circuit with their distribution of outputs with um, 63 qubits, is it really hard to simulate? Or can you find a clever way of simulating it? And 
The answer is it actually turns out that you can find a clever way of simulating this random circuit with 63 qubits. So I think that was that IBM paper about it, correct? Yeah. So you can ask, is there a, you know, if you go up to a hundred qubits and you've done a random circuit, is it still hard to simulate? Is it, does it now become hard to simulate or can you simulate a hundred qubit random circuit on a classical computer? And but this, I think we are not even there. I think that like 100, maybe we don't have it or. We don't have it yet. We will have yeah. it soon. But so we, um, and the other question is, is, are there things you can do on a hundred qubits that are hard to simulate? And the answer I think is undoubtedly yes, because so um, <clears throat> there's this idea of quantum simulators, which are these, I guess, arrays of I guess ions are um, neutral atoms that you can put a Hamiltonian on and then start them in some state and let them evolve and see what happens. And with that, you can simulate, you know, condensed matter systems that um, we don't know how to simulate on classical computers. And they already have some simulations some results from simulations of systems that you can't simulate on classical computers. Or at least nobody knows how to simulate classical computers. Now, this isn't a real quantum computer because you can't address the qubits individually. However, it is a quantum you know, some experiment. Kind of quantum, some kind of quantum computation device which is doing things that nobody knows how to simulate on classical computers yet. But it is somehow designed to do this particular case. It cannot do other stuff, like cannot do the uh, short algorithm, cannot do Grover search or other that this has of now. Right. It can, oh, yeah, it can only simulate arbitrary Hamiltonians. Can I take my music stuff upstairs? Oh, um, just hold on. Uh, my wife needs to use this room. Let me go upstairs. Yeah, sure. I, I have to gather myself up so that will take like two minutes. I'm going upstairs. Okay. 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 So, uh, thanks. Oh, I, think. I need to. I need to plug my computer in first. Yeah, I think that's important. <laughs> you don't want to just disconnect it. Plug behind here. I know. See if I can see what it is. Okay. Okay. And great. So I think uh, thanks for me for accommodating this. It became it large, but I mean, hopefully we will uh, uh, like uh, try to uh, wrap it up soon. But I think this is the important part. I think so. The Google one, I think we were discussing that. I mean, they are designed something to do some particular things that, as you mentioned, for sixty we can do something clever. I think that was the IBM paper. But maybe for one hundred we cannot do it. Or um, yeah. So. Uh, it, but uh, I think turning them into some quantum computer still takes time. So uh, like, uh, that's like, so uh, one other question. So with this uh, 60 uh, qubits, can they uh, solve like, uh, can they run some uh, quantum algorithm with 60 qubits that they have or even that they have a problem? Um, 
So they can run a quantum algorithm with 60 qubits as long as it doesn't, you know, as as long as they don't have to run it too long. Because there's a little bit of noise with each step. So if you want to run it more than, I forget the number, a few hundred steps, it becomes too noisy to actually get the answer. So, so this one cannot still run, for example, uh, short algorithm or Grover algorithm, correct? No. Yeah, so that's like, uh, great. And uh, so I think given the, the thing that you mentioned, so it's still maybe for <laughs> 10 more years or even more, we may uh, need <laughs> more time, but you believe that it will be constructed at near few, I don't know, near means 10, 15 years or something. Well, I think there's possibility that it'll be, you know, built in the next 10, 15 years. I think there's also a possibility that it will take at least 30 years and there's probably a small possibility that we'll never build it. Uh, okay, so <laughs> that's, I think, the best that we can uh, guess on that. Uh, great. So I think uh, we discussed about, uh, I mean, lots of important things that we wanted to uh, discuss. Let me see, I mean, is there any... Uh, yeah, and, uh, one other thing. Uh, have you done, I mean, like, uh, of course, you had this nice algorithm. Have you been involved with any other startups or any other companies, essentially, to do that? Because I know that I mean, some of the people, like, for example, like Caltech or something, they are, have you tried to do that? So, yeah. I haven't done that, no. Uh, and are you interested even in mean, getting into, or you still like to work more on theory side? Um, well, I mean, I'll probably be retiring in the next, I don't know, five, 10, 15 years. And um, I don't know, I still want to do some work on the theory side, I think. The theory side is like more exciting about it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, have you done I mean, any like the practical things when you have been at the uh, AT&T? Like, because there actually at that time you could do whatever you want. Uh, and. Uh, I was involved with some of, like, for example, the networking people to do some of this, but I think a lot of them were researched. Yeah. So that is. So I guess at AT and T, there's this. Um, you know, there was this. Well, you were there, right? There's this annual yeah. review, and if you've been doing great theory, they yeah. don't ask you to do any um, practical stuff. Exactly. And if you've been doing not so great theory, they ask you to do practical stuff. Okay. And yeah. They never really asked me to do practical stuff. I actually did some practical stuff like these rectilinear Steiner arborescences were, um, well, they came from a practical problem. I mean, we took the practical problem and we developed an algorithm and we showed that this Russian algorithm was wrong. So we developed an approximation algorithm and then we did a bunch more theory with regard to it. And, um, Let's see so the that. application came from AT and T. The application came from AT and T. Oh, okay, so that, that, that was not. That's uh, great. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's the thing. And uh, uh, I think I mean currently uh, I mean I was reading that you are uh, chair of the applied math uh, at MIT. I mean the chair committee. Have you considered I mean more uh, like maybe leadership positions or something? I mean like you have a great vision. So uh, of course I mean you have a, I mean you had. A, very, uh, I mean, good uh, PhD students, but have you ever thought about <laughs> going and do more uh, well, leadership? I, I, I really do not want to be a department head. You don't want it. Which was the <laughs> next step up from the head of the applied math. Yeah. It's, the applied math is one of the two divisions of the math department. Yeah. And the, you know, it's not that much work being head of applied math being head of the math department in full is actually a very heavy, <laughs> very heavy. much harder job. Yeah, uh, uh, great. And there's actually one other thing that we also discussed, I think uh, uh, that we are toward the end, that uh, like with uh, Professor Madhu Sudan and Professor David Karger about like when you work with PhD students, how do you work with them? I mean, I heard some essentially from my friends, but I think like uh, like how close are you working? There are there some special hours that you are working or sometimes you are interested in, you may work with them, you may even at night or... Well, like, I, it depends on, um, it depends on the student. 
you know, possibly what the student actually, um, you know, what the student's preferred mode of working is. I mean, there are some students I meet every week and we talk and um, sometimes we collaborate. And there are other students who um, don't really want to meet me every week. They go away, they solve problems, they come back, they show me the papers and that's great. <laughs> yeah, you're happy, they are happy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 great. So that's like a more, uh, uh, like depending on the students, you might have a different strategy, but they don't have your cell phone, for example, to call you anytime. Um, they have my email. They have your email, yeah. Yeah, they oh, have yeah. my. Um, do so. I think actually, I think one of them does have my cell phone. Yes, but okay. he, he very rarely calls me on it, except yeah. I mean. You know, coordinating with him with some social events, he's called me on it or he's yeah. texted me on it, but anything else he's, um, I mean, maybe shy to call you for that yeah. one. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, great. And uh, so I think uh, maybe actually we mentioned, I mean, some of this, I think this uh, open problems. So we mentioned some of them from the practical side, essentially this one that you mentioned that uh, can we have any breakthrough in, uh, I mean, showing, I mean, that doubling the number of uh, physical qubits every year, I think that's important. I mean, or you say that we don't need actually too many qubits and we can do better with fault tolerance. I think that's from the practical side, that's I think the, probably the biggest <laughs> uh, open problem in the practical side. What about in the uh, theory side? And uh, what, yeah, what about the theory side? So the quantum uh, coding or quantum computations, what are the main things? Or like, what other problem you think that there might have some faster quantum uh, algorithm for that. I think that would be also great too. Like some of the conjecture that you think that given your vision that these problems may have actually that and we are not there yet. Any graph problems or other things, yeah. Right, well, I mean, I don't have any good problems to look at for finding quantum algorithms for. They all seem, um, really quite hard <laughs> so i don't have any suggestions for that now for um i mean there is a question of whether you can do the pc you know there's a quantum pcp theorem yeah and you know one you know there was this one conjecture that was proved recently which is um you know, which is a prerequisite for the quantum PCP theorem. And it's actually true, but, um, you know, it's still a long way from that to the PC, quantum, to a quantum PCP theorem. Uh, great. So that is uh, like quantum PCP. Actually, we talked with uh, Professor Madison on previous time. So that's the uh, interesting thing that, I mean, can we do the quantum version of that? And I, I think uh, as we discussed, so the catch is that, I mean, like, for example, we use that idea of, I mean, like uh, to getting a sub-quadratic algorithm for any distance. But the uh, idea is that you want a new idea. So it's not just using, I mean, like, I mean, short idea, Grover's idea, just change them and make it that, that maybe is not that satisfactory. There are several, lots of applications of this type of things. And, but something that, I mean, more powerful, we don't know. And uh, what about like quantum versus MP hardness? So, uh, do we, uh, I mean, uh, I think there are some distinction that we have. We don't believe that quantum can solve MP, MP complete problems. We don't believe quantum can solve MP hard problems. I mean, it'd be great if it could, but I don't see any real evidence for it being able to. And uh, do we have any, I mean, conditional lower bounds there? I don't think so. But uh, so far it's more belief essentially is that. Yeah. Uh, great. And uh, I think like uh, some final words. So I think that from the higher schoolers, I mean, like uh, the people, I mean, might be younger people. I mean, they may, uh, I think one way that you went, I mean, the whole thing, you have started with math, went to math Olympiad, and then, I mean, continued your things and you had this great achievements and great algorithms. I think that was quite visionary. So uh, any suggestions for the, I mean, uh, high schoolers, they are interested, they want to do uh, 
the next big things essentially um well i mean I mean, one of the reasons I found the quantum computing algorithm was that I knew a little bit of computer science. I knew a little bit of number theory. I knew a little bit of physics. I knew a little bit of, you know, Fourier transforms. And um, I guess that's, that probably actually falls under signal processing. But um, so I, I do a lot of diverse things in different areas of mathematics, and I was able to put them together and get the quantum factoring algorithm. So one thing I want to say is don't be too specialized. Learn a lot of broad things. And um, that was very useful for me. I don't know. I mean, I think I can add actually that's a very great actually uh... Uh, recommendation because I, this, I mean, lots of, I mean, people who are great actually in computer science or other fields, I mean, that's the thing that they are reading a lot and they can connect the dots. I think that's a very important one, but you need to understand them. You, if you want to just get the results soon, maybe you become too narrow in some particular field, but it might be good to just read it and let your brain work essentially and hopefully connects them in a nice way. I don't know, quantum way I or... Uh, the neurons and whatever approach that they are taking to connect them and make a big thing. I think that's a, actually great uh, things to do it. But but at the same time, I think you have done also in one area of mathematics, you specifically, I mean, spend more time and I mean, you could excel there. I mean, because I going actually, I can, uh, I mean, uh, like going from US and become the like four or six people who represent US is not an easy thing. The country is like as 300 million, 320, 330 million now. So it's not an easy thing. But uh, of course, I mean, that's the uh, path I think is important. And I think, uh, uh, what about uh, like this math Olympiad or computer Olympiad? Do you recommend them as well? Or if you have, if you take it again, if you were a child, did you take the same path? Um. I think the path works, so yeah. <laughs> so I think that's a good thing. I, I think that's also a good way because of competing. Competing is like not easy, I will say, but I mean, at the end, I think you get some <laughs> benefit out of it that you might be happy about. Yeah, uh, so uh, thanks a lot for the, I think that was, I think, uh, very <laughs> nice and visionary. We discussed about lots of some technical stuff and also, I mean, the life. Uh, thanks for your time. I think the people will enjoy that and I recommend, I mean, the people look at uh, this one. We had uh, some questions and yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I'm sorry I um, forgot this morning, but... Um, yeah, that happens. That's the definition of live, essentially. You I think, I think from now on, if I'm doing anything on the weekend, I'm going to set an alarm on my phone. Yeah, I think that would be the this same. Is a, this isn't the first time I've missed something on the weekend. I see. Uh, so that's like the... Uh, but yeah, I think that's uh, good. So hopefully you can have more free time in the weekend <laughs> to do your yeah. personal okay. thing. Yeah. Uh, thanks right. a lot. And uh, uh, bye <laughs> to Peter. Okay, and to bye. Thanks. Bye for now.